Welcome to the CEC report for June 27. I'm Elisa Barwick and with me is Craig Isherwood. Welcome back, Craig. Yeah, thanks, Elisa. It's good to be back That's after good. a bit of a break. Yep. Now, on today's show, CEC issues open letter to Catholics. Rally to Pope Francis's fight against free market economy. And case study, Argentina battles the vulture hedge funds. So today's report is a bit of a special edition, really, to launch our latest New Citizen newspaper, an ecumenical response to Evangelii Gaudium, Listen to Pope Francis, an open letter to the Catholic Church in Australia. Now, um, this intervention by the Pope is within the worsening spiritual and economic crisis, which is now gripping the world. And he's called for a new evangelization, and this document he put out was put out in uh, 26 November last year. Um, he says in the beginning, in the introduction to this document, that we cannot passively and calmly wait in our church buildings. We must be a church which goes forth permanently in a state of mission. So the question is, why has he put out this call for a new evangelization, which is presumably what the church always does? Well, he spends an entire chapter on discussing the economic crisis. That's what chapter two is about. And at the outset of that chapter, he says, certain present realities, unless effectively dealt with, are capable of setting off processes of dehumanization, which would then be hard to reverse. And that's a pretty stark thing to say, right, Craig? Yeah, I think it's a bit of a shock. We're talking about religion here. We're actually not talking about religion. No. We're talking about politics. And for the viewers who are watching this show are saying, well, I thought I'd tuned into the CC report to hear politics. Mm. Well, look, Pope Francis has take, taken a very, very important step here in actually bringing uh, the, the truth about what is happening in the world to the reality, to the forefront of all the major thinkers by putting this document out. Mm. And he, what he says about politics is really, really crucial here. Because what he says, and I quote from an interview he did just in, you know, a couple of weeks ago on the 13th of June, he said that politics is one of the more elevated forms of love, of charity. Why? Because it leads to the common good and a person who, despite being able to do it, does not get involved in politics for the common good is selfish or, that un or uses politics for their own good is corrupt. So here he had, this mm. is the reason why he has intervened here. Mm. And as we go through in the front part of our new citizen, Elisa, 25 years ago, uh, we refounded this organisation on a principle. Mm -hmm. we, uh, the, that principle is the principle of Imago Bivide. Mm. That is that all human beings are created in God's image. We're endowed with a special capability of creative reason, which means that we can make discoveries of how the universe works, how physical principles, which sets us apart from every other animal on the face of the planet. Mm. This is what makes us godlike. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about this new evangelization, mm. it's not you know religious speak. It, well, it's coming from the Pope, so yes, it is religious speak. But what he is saying is that we have to bring to the world the reality that human beings are not mere animals, that mm. we are fundamentally different in that we're created godlike in the sense that we have this creative re reason that we can solve the problems of the of the universe solve the problems that we have by making discoveries of physical mm. principles now no other animal has that no and that capability of man to do that is the basis of a good and functioning economic policy which benefits all humankind it is, it's also the basis of true happiness mm. and also if that policy that philosophy ideology is adopted it means that we don't have to have the suffering that we have that mm. he is referring mm -hmm. to here. We just do not have mm. to have it. Yeah, but what we have is a, a system of free trade imposed over the top of this, artificially imposed. And I want to just quote two of the paragraphs from the Evangelii Gaudium. You can read more in our newspaper or go direct to the source. So in 53, the Pope states, just as the commandment, thou shalt not kill, sets a clear limit in order to safeguard the value of human life, today we also have to say, thou shalt not, to an economy of exclusion and inequality. Such an economy kills. How can it be that it is not a news item when an elderly homeless person dies of exposure, but it is news when the stock market loses two points? This is a case of exclusion. 
Can we continue to stand by when food is thrown away while people are starving? This is a case of inequality. Today, everything comes under the laws of competition and the survival of the fittest, where the powerful feed upon the powerless. As a consequence, masses of people find themselves excluded and marginalised, without work, without possibilities, without any means of escape. And then the second quote from number 56, while the earnings of a minority are growing exponentially, so too is the gap separating the majority from the prosperity enjoyed by those happy few. This imbalance is the result of ideologies which defend the absolute autonomy of the marketplace and financial speculation. Consequently, they reject the rights of states charged with vigilance for the common good to exercise any form of control. A new tyranny is thus born, invisible and often virtual, which unilaterally and relentlessly imposes its own laws and rules. So very strong words there. Mm. Now our open letter takes it a step further because um, there's two things we do in the open letter. We name the names of the creators of this fraudulent economic system now known as free trade globalisation and we present the solution, the concrete policies, uh, starting with Glass-Steagall, which it's not the, jobs, the, the Pope's job to do. Now, firstly, on the question of naming the names, I wanted to draw out from that last quote where the Pope said that the imbalance we're seeing in today's economy is the result of ideologies which defend the absolute auto autonomy of the marketplace. This question mm. of ideologies, the ideologies behind going further than just the economic theories is really crucial, uh, Craig. Yeah. I think if you go back into Australian history, Elisa, you see where the ideology that the Pope is talking about, this idea of the common good, this expression of agape, as we call it, or of, of charity, of love, it's found in what we used to call the old Labor Party. People going back to, you know, Kurt and Chifley O'Malley, even before that, to the great founder of the uh, Australian Workers Union, uh, uh, Spence, where these people talk about the idea that the role of government, the role of the governing institutions, mm. is to support the common good. Now, what we've seen in Australia in particular since the 1970s has been ta is a takeover, where these policies that the Pope just described as you know, literally destroying the happiness and the prosperity only for a very few people, mm. uh, is, was done by an institution called the Mont Pelerin Society. Now, we've detailed in chapter and verse for since 1996 mm -hmm. the takeover of Australia by the Mont Pelerin Society, which really started uh, uh, here in Australia in, about in, in the early 70s. However, it was, there was also case studies that we did in New Zealand mm -hmm. about the takedown of the uh, New Zealand economy through policies like economic rationalism, the privatisation of, of assets. And Jeff Kennett in this state was the pioneer, in a sense, under the Mont Pelerin Society's instruction of privatising publicly owned assets. And since then, there's just been absolute fire sale after fire sale, whereby this ideology of the, um, of the marketplace determines everything, which is this free trade ideology, has governed everything. So what you've seen, uh, and it's just not here in Australia, it's, that's around the world. Mm. Now it's brought us to the point that we have a, uh, a, a financial and monetary system that's in the point of implosion, mm. of disintegration. Mm -hmm. at the highest level. We have enormous amounts of unpayable debt or enormous amounts of speculation, you know, 1.5, 1.6 quadrillion dollars of speculative turnover in the system, which is completely unpayable, which is causing policies that we've talked about on this program, like the need for bail-in to steal people's deposits in order to p prop up the banking system. Mm. But, I mean, this is what the Pope is attacking, mm. specifically. Mm. And that the Mont Pelerin Society, as you referenced, um, well, it grew out of the Austrian school of economics and the main tenet of that school was that money is primary in economics and the two founders of the Mont Pelerin Society were Friedrich von Hayek and Milton Friedman mm. and both of these guys which we um, elaborate on in the newspaper attacked the idea of the common good. Uh, John Maynard Keynes was another one of the key figures um, he advocated one world government with a global central bank and global currency. One of his absolute heroes was pastor, a parson Thomas Malthus, Malthus the yes. author of Malthusianism, uh, which is a depopulation uh, agenda. 
and he believed that the common good was a phantom of the imagination. So you see the common ideology running through all these guys, also Bernard de Mandeville was another one of the key thinkers who we've spoken about on this show before, who believed that you should just let people uh, be as evil as they like, you know, practice their pleasures to whatever degree, and that would bring about a greater good mm. magically somehow, not unlike Adam Smith's free hand. And of course, Adam Smith was a part of this entire school. Um, in fact, the, uh, there's a book which is called The End of Certainty by Paul Kelly, the Murdoch scribe, which discusses this Mont Pelerin society and how it took over the Liberal Party in Australia um, during the Fraser government and thereafter. And he actually says that the high priests of their doctrine were the 18th century philosopher and economist Adam Smith, the Austrian theorist Friedrich Hayek, and the American economist Milton Friedman. Mm. So I think also, Elisa, it's very important to point out this is a question of ideology. You know, it's not a, just a question of these things happen out of nowhere. This, the, the policies that we're seeing to destroy the common good development of our country is a policy that's driven from an ideology. And John Maynard Keynes is the high priest that was picked out, in a sense, or supported by the British Empire directly in order to promote his policy. But you have to hear what he says. He says uh, in, in his book, uh, The General Theory of Employment, Interest and Money, which he wrote in 36, he says, the ideas of economists and political philosophers, both when they are right and when they are wrong, are more powerful than is commonly understood. It, indeed, the world is ruled by little else. Practical men who believe themselves to be quite exempt from any intellectual influence are usually the slaves of some defunct economist. I am sure that the power of vested interests is vastly exaggerated compared with the gradual encroachment of ideas. Mm. So what Pope Francis is hitting is at the very core of the power of these ideas. That's right. Now this is the real battleground. We have to stop there, but we'll talk about the solution to this whole mess after the break. Okay, welcome back. We're just talking about our open letter to the Catholic Church, and we've discussed the problems of the free market economy that the Pope's identified. Now, of course, what our paper does is it lays out the concrete solutions to what the Pope is presenting. Um, now, I just want to say the Pope does call for action on this, even though he doesn't specify exactly the concrete proposals as we have done. What he says in number 58 is a financial reform open to such ethical considerations would require a vigorous change of approach on the part of political leaders. I urge them to face this challenge with determination and an eye to the future, while not ignoring, of course, the specifics of each case. Money must serve, not rule. I exhort you to generous solidarity and to the return of economics and finance to an ethical approach which favours human beings. So Craig, how would Glass-Steagall deal with this, not in one fell swoop, but as the beginning point to unleash a wave of economic recovery and development? Well, he's hit the nail on the head by saying money must serve, not rule. Mm. Now, we are, unfortunately, right now in a monetarist system where money is the, the god, you might say, that's being worshipped. And then that's seen a huge amount of speculation of, or so-called activity, financial activity devoid of real physical, uh, physical economic development. What we are saying with the Glass-Steagall, led by Lyndon LaRouche in the United States, is that we need to have a policy introduced into our country based upon the Glass-Steagall where you separate out in the banking system the commercial banks that you need to be able to administer money from the speculative investment side of the, the current financial and monetary system. You quarantine it, you get rid of it, you, you, you tame it, you don't allow it to direct the activity you have in your economy. But you have to go further than that. You have to have a different type of banking which we call national banking which actually emits large amounts of credit in order to, and this might sound strange, in order to suffice the imagination. Hmm. Because see, human beings are created imago Dei. We are creative beings. Therefore, we should be funding creative initiatives mm -hmm. like large-scale infrastructure development projects, like, for example, high-speed magnetic levitation trains, not on the basis that it makes monetary sense from the point of view of balancing the books monetarily for profits for boardrooms and so forth, mm. but 
because it, it, it lifts up and develops the physical economic capacity of the nation. Mm. And that means, like I say, that's, these things, three things go hand in hand. So you have, this, is, this is a very radical, different approach to uh, what the Pope, uh, which, which the Pope is calling for than we have today. Everything today is governed by the boardrooms of the financial banking systems of the big mm -hmm. banks. Mm -hmm. Everything is determined by the profit margins, the dividends of so-called of the big banks globally. And consequently, that is why we're in the mess we mm -hmm. are today. So it's quite straightforward, really. I mean, we have to put people ahead of the banks, regulate the banks. I mean, surround them with regulations so they can barely not move. Well, we have a brilliant example of that in World War II. Because you, during the war, you had the possibility of the banks speculating with the shortages that come up as you mo mobilise goods towards a war effort. Mm. Curtin and Chifley placed very strong regulation onto the banking system, so you're not going to do that. Mm -hmm. And those regulations worked fantastically that we were able to increase our physical economic output mm. during the war to phenomenal levels mm. that we'd never seen before. Because government control of credit can actually allow those things to flourish as opposed to the speculation. Because you've reined in. The power of the government is acting for the common good to rein in the mm. common greed mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of the banking system. Mm. So that's what the Pope's calling for. He's mm. saying, no, money is not going to be a, a master. It's going to be the slave. It should be the slave. It should be contained mm. to nothing more as an instrument to promote mm. economic growth with inside an economy. Now, this is laid... He's laying this proposal squarely at the feet of Catholic uh, Tony Abbott, mm -hmm. of Joe Hockey. So this is not no longer just a, um, you know, just some nice idea. This is, this is the core... Mm of the, the message that he is sending as the leader of the Christian church in the, in the, in the Roman Catholic circles to his faithful. Mm. And he's saying, you've got to do something about this. Yeah, and because you're really talking about the power of the state being equivalent to the power of the common good, dictating policy that is for the benefit of all, whereas free trade is quite the opposite. It allows certain key individuals who have the capability to manipulate and game the system to work their way forward. Does Tony Abbott have the guts mm. to do what John Curtin and Ben Chifley did in World War II and have the guts to follow actually what Pope Francis is saying. Yeah. That is the issue for yeah. them. Well, Abbott and Hockey are both Catholics, so they should, but Abbott at Davos earlier this year said we should all be missionaries for freer trade, so he's said quite the opposite at mm. this point. Now, we're going to look at a case study of this Argentina after the break. Welcome back. Case study, Argentina versus the Vulture Funds. Now, there was a decision by the US Supreme Court on the 16th of June, which will force Argentina to pay out hedge funds to the tune of US $1.5 billion on the 30th of June. Now, just to give the background of this, in 2001, because of the IMF policies which had completely looted and stripped Argentina's economy, Argentina went into a default on their sovereign debt. Now, in 2005, whilst they were rebuilding the economy, ditching all the IMF policies, uh, they renegotiated that sovereign debt and 92% of creditors accepted that and, in fact, have been paid out without missing any payments. Some of the institutions, like the IMF and the World Bank, were paid out in full mm -hmm. and written off the debt so that they're not beholden to them anymore. However... The other part of the 92% were hedge funds and so forth who did not agree to those terms of the renegotiated debts, which were subject to a haircut and they were also at lower interest rates and over longer terms. The hedge funds held out. They are now de demanding full payment on the face value of the debt that they own. And by the way, um, these bonds that they hold, they purchased them before Argentina went into default when what they were at absolute rock bottom. Mm. So they bought these bonds for literally cents on the dollar and now they're demanding the full face value of this. Now this could bankrupt Argentina and it could actually bring down the entire global financial system. Because of the interconnectedness with all the derivatives and so forth sold by these hedge funds and wealth funds and so forth based upon this debt. Exactly. Now. Not only did the court order allow for this payment to be made to these, well, they're actually they're known as vulture funds, mm. not just hedge funds, and they're all City of London-based entities, 
but also the, um, the court ruling would allow for Argentine assets anywhere in the world to be seized to execute payment of these bonds if necessary. Now, the Uruguayan president, Jose Mujica, who has stood up in solidarity with Argentina on this, said on the 22nd of June that the vulture funds are going to come after Argentina's oil. He said they will want to eat Argentina's oil for nothing and they'll end up proposing that the debt be paid with natural resources. Now, in fact, that bore out already because a day after the US Supreme Court decision, NML Capital, which is one of the vulture funds, went before Californian courts to demand discovery on the location of Argentine oil. They're demanding information from Chevron Corp, ExxonMobil, Dow Chemical and Apache Corp that they provide information about where oil assets may be located. And these are the companies that work uh, in partnership with the Argentine oil company, which was renationalized YPF. So Craig, this is really, is it not another form of bail-in where the banks and the hedge funds are just pulling in dollars because they are on the verge of bankruptcy. Their whole system's about to implode. And in fact, this could detonate the whole global system if they get away with this, if other countries do not intervene, uh, if other voices do not come forward and stop this insanity. Well, as I mentioned before, there's a 1.5, 1.6, we don't really know, quadrillion dollar speculative bubble built around derivatives, right? 1.56 quadrillion dollars. So the degree that Argentina is forced to pay this debt and then it goes into default again could trigger the implosion of the entire world's financial and monetary system. It could be set off as within Argentina. But the real evil here, Elisa, coming back to what we had in the first segment with, uh, with Pope Francis, mm. this is actually an evil policy. People can see how evil the policy is by the fact literally they're going to force, again, like they've done in Greece, people to starve in mm. order to pay these speculative vulture funds that have made no investment into anything except money, mm. pennies in the dollar, as mm -hmm. you said. They're demanding full payment back which is literally going to come out of the real wealth that should be there available for the people mm. of Argentina. And this is why this is causing such a ruckus, because what Argentina has done is they've renegotiated and they've successfully paid off, they've reorganised their economy with a focus on investment, develop into development technologies. They've had an increase into investment in science and technology by 937%. They've repatriated nearly a thousand scientists who were driven out under the IMF regime. So the terror of the financial elites is that this alternative to the austerity coming down in Greece and Spain and Portugal and Italy and what's planned and being introduced here with our budget is going to be washed away and that you're going to see real alternatives and by the fact that a lot of South America are banding together behind um, Argentina, as is Russia. The Catholic, uh, Argentine Catholic bishops put out a statement in which they called upon leaders to put the common good of the people first and to take heed of the Pope's critique of the financial system and the economic system centred solely on money. So this really is what brings us back to the words of the Pope. So contact us to get a copy, a free copy of this. You can find out more about Argentina in our EIR journal or our Australian Alert Service uh, and get onto our website because the other danger is as this financial system comes down is the danger of war and the Pope has also referenced that in terms that because this is a system that cannot survive as great empires have done in the past they will make war if they can't go with World War III they'll create zonal wars as we're seeing blowing up now so get onto our website find out more and tune in again next week to the CC report